We will begin with the consent agenda. Are there any items? Bear with me. I'm still trying to find my pen and everything else here. All right. Consent. Any items? Ms. Burke. C3. C3. C7E. C7E. Miss Adams, you got anything? I'll look real quick. If there aren't any, I move approval of the balance. Second. Oh, one second. I had C3 as well. That's it. We have a motion to approve the balance. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed likewise. <laughs> So we will have C3 and C7E. We'll start with C3, if the secretary could read that, please. Item C3, resolution authorizing the issuance of a quick claim deed to the Board of Trustees for Forsyth Technical <coughs> Community College, located in the Northeast Ward. Mr. Borling, are you are you're here? Could you come up, please? Okay, uh, this is the Forsyth Tech uh, uh, North Campus, and there is a sewer line uh, running to the property, and um, Forsyth Tech has improved, of course, that property over the years, and there is an uh, existing sewer line that is of unknown origin, really, and ownership is unknown, and they have requested that the city uh, quick claim deed this to them, and the city has examined the situation and uh, does not believe that they own it, but we've been advised that to clear the matter up, it would be best to just issue a quick claim deed to Forsyth Tech that we don't claim any ownership of that and that we would have no responsibility in the future to any maintenance of that line going to their campus there. Uh, yes, this is in the old uh, Strip Shopping Center uh, near Patterson that was uh, re, uh, remodeled several years ago. It's a very nice facility up there. Yes. This, I think, they do the auto repair. Yes, that's correct. Any other questions or comments? Second. We have a, a motion to second approve C3. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed likewise. That passes. We will now go to C7E. Item C7E, resolution awarding contracts for furniture and furnishings for police districts one and three located in the Northeast Ward and the Southwest Ward. Oh, the construction phase? Could you repeat the question, please? I couldn't hear. Both, both, both stations are under construction right now. Um, District 3 on Stratford Road is a little bit ahead because we had to do a redesign on District 1, but we expect to have both buildings done by the spring of next year. The District 3 station is off of Stratford Road, and the District 1 station is off of North Point Boulevard. We have a motion and a second on C7E. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed likewise. We will now go to the general agenda. There are six items on here. I have a note from the city attorney stating that Mr. Montgomery needs to be excused from G2 and 3. I'm going to go ahead and take care of that uh, before we get into the general agenda. Is there a motion to excuse him on those two items? I move that we exclude <coughs> Councilmember Montgomery from G two and two three. And three. Okay. We have a motion to second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed likewise. That is approved. So Mr. Montgomery, when we get those, be sure that I duly note that in the vote. We begin with G one. Secretary, read that. Item G one. Consideration of items relating to the issuance of multifamily housing revenue bonds, Rolling Hills Apartments, Series 2016. <laughs> A, resolution approving finance team and making certain findings with respect to the issuance of multifamily housing revenue bonds. 
Series 2016 in the amount of $7,800,000, and B, resolution authorizing issuance and sale of multifamily housing revenue bonds for Rolling Hills Apartments, Series 2016. Ms. Saunders, why don't you just give us a one-minute reintroduction okay. of this since it's been a while since we've gone over it? We'll do. Um, um, on September 19th, meeting, City Council gave preliminary approval for the issuance of multifamily um, housing revenue bonds. The attached resolution completes the legal process to issue these bonds. The first item, A, will be a public hearing on Monday night, October the 17th, on these bonds. B, there will be two resolutions to be considered. One is actually approving the financing team and making certain facts of the revenue bonds that are being issued. And the second resolution will be the authorization and sale of the multifamily revenue bonds of an amount up not to exceed $7.8 million. Um, as a reminder, this is not a debt of the city of Winston-Salem. We're only used as an avenue to issue the bonds to fund the project. Thank you. Any questions from anyone here? I would ask, uh, will these bonds be rated? And will they use our city typical rating to rate them? They will be rated, but they'll be rated based on the project revenues of the bonds. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, move approval. We have a motion. Is there a second? second? We have a motion to second on G1. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed likewise. That is approved. We will now go to G2. I'm Item here if you'll read that. Thank you. Item G2, consideration of items authorizing modifications to an agreement for rental assistance with the Housing Authority of the City of Winston-Salem, A, resolution authorizing modifications to agreement for rental assistance with Hawes, and B, ordinance amending the project budget ordinance for the City of Winston-Salem, North Carolina for the fiscal year 2016-2017. Mr. Brooks, why don't you give us the two minutes on this one? Yes. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor, Councilmember Clark, members of the committee. This item is very similar to the one that we presented to Council last last month regarding the bridge funding for for the uh, housing authority uh, the one difference is the home agreement was received in late september and home funds will be available going forward the agreements have been signed and sent back we have not received the executed copies is back yet uh, so as soon as we get those back then we'll be able to transfer funds from the grant so this is a request to have bridge funds to cover this hopefully what would be one last period okay, thank you any questions or comments on this one uh, is there a motion to approve <coughs> Second. all in favor say aye aye opposed and so we passed us three in favor none opposed and one excused yeah. yes ma'am excuse me go ahead <coughs> That would be a good idea. Mr. Garrity, could you comment on that? We, uh, we were going to bring that back next month, uh, Choice Neighborhoods, along with the New Hope Project. Uh, staff has been working with Hawes on, on that issue. We haven't finished all the inspections or the appraisal, but we'll hopefully come back in, in November. Okay. Because yeah, we certainly have a significant update in that area. We will now go to G3. Item G3, resolution authorizing submission of a youth homelessness demonstration program application and execution of agreements. Mr. Brooks, don't go far. There you are. You'll introduce this to us. Yes. This particular item is one where on the 22nd of August, HUD announced that it would select 10, up to 10 communities to participate in a youth homelessness demonstration program to learn how communities can prevent and end youth homelessness for young people under age 24. Special emphasis on the program are pregnant and part parenting youth, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans transgender, and questioning LGBTQ youth and minors. To ensure representation uh, in this process, a youth advisory board will be incorporated into the continuum of care to ensure youth participation in the policy making decisions if this is approved and the city is selected. Uh, the community selected will be announced in January, <coughs> and at that time, each community will develop and implement a coordinated community plan to prevent and end youth homelessness. HUD will make available at least $1 million 
per community for the project. One year renewable planning grants and two year renewable project applications may be submitted. The city will just essentially be a pass through on this. Only the cease the continuum of care collaborative applicant, which we are as the city may apply. Our local continuum of care has requested that the city submit this application. Any questions? So this is just a motion to approve the filing of the application. That's correct. And you say it is a pass through. Who so, in <clears throat> I'm sorry. Who in town is going to actually implement this then? The continuum of care. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Comments? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. Uh the youth advisory board, <clears throat> it hasn't been put together yet, right? Correct. And when it does, we'll see, will the mayor appoint those people? Just you appoint the continuum of care, the council? Yeah, we recommend, I recommend to you. So it will be the same for that as well? I would imagine so. Okay. Um, there are some criteria. Yeah, I'd like to, whenever you get a chance, just get that to me what the criteria is or are for those people. Okay, we'll do that. Yes, ma'am. I move for a second. We have a motion second. Any other comments on this? Uh, again, we're filing for We hope we get it, but we don't know until somebody get. makes a decision. <laughs> anyway, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? So we have three in favor, none opposed, and one um, excused. We will now go to G4. <clears throat> Item G4, resolution authorizing a commitment of funds to S.G. Atkins Community Development Corporation for the Enterprise Center in the amount of 165000 Brooks, you're a busy man today. <laughs> yes, yeah, seems that way. <laughs> Keep going. In June 2010, the city approved a total of 710000 in funding for S.G. Atkins to develop part of the former Boys and Girls Club building, which is located on South Main Street into the Enterprise Center. I think we all are familiar with that particular facility and how it's been operating very efficiently and providing services to a number of different groups. Uh, the funding for this is from the Housing Finance Assistance Fund and the 2000 General Obligation Bond Funds helped to transform the second floor into a small business incubator. They developed part of the first floor into teaching space for the Winston-Salem State University nursing program. In November, the city approved 209,000 in CDBG funds to convert the old gymnasium into a multi-purpose room that can be used for training classes, community meetings, conferences, and other events. And in 2013-14, the city approved 500,000 and CDBG funds to convert the lower level into additional space for the business incubator, and that's performing well. There are currently 34 businesses in the incubator. At this time, the CDC is requesting $165,000 to create a shared use licensed commercial kitchen that will provide entrepreneurs timeshare access and production of facilities at a reasonable fee. It will be an opportunity for startup and for businesses to do startup and expand specialty food and catering businesses without having the excessive cost of establishing their own business. Um, and the uh, CDC will supplement this grant with an existing $65,000 to pay part-time staff for kitchen management. It will also create an advisory committee, which will include staff from the Cooperative Extension Service, the Farmers Market, local growers, caterers, and the County Environmental Health Officer. And in the CARF, we list what the uses of the funds would be, which would be to do some construction and provide equipment. The funds will be community development block grant funds if you choose to do so and will be, deferred, will be a deferred loan that is forgiven at the end of 20 years. Funds are appropriated for this type of project and an appropriate resolution is attached. Those funds would be community development public facility funds. Thank you, sir. Any questions? And I do know some, some of the Atkins CDC folks are here if we need their 
Yes, ma'am, Ms. Burke. So I support the process and this is going to be spent on taxes in a very wise way. I would like to ask uh, Attorney uh, Davis a question about the Ms. Davis, you can come up, please. I'll say again, I support the project 100%. Thank you. Always something going on over there. I, my, the question I have, are you all making money over there? Good question. You would ask me that question. <laughs> well, let me take this opportunity first to say thank you to all of you, uh, city staff and council members, for supporting this project. You know, we started, we acquired the building in 2010, and then you all have been partnered with us since we started the renovation in 2011. This is really the last piece. Uh, getting this commercial kitchen uh, finished is the last piece of this project. We've leveraged city funds with uh, $3 million of federal funding that we brought from the U.S. Department of Commerce and from HUD. And of the 34 businesses that are in the building do currently pay a monthly rental fee for their office space. And in return, they get a furnished office with internet, um, copy, scanner, fax machine. We provide free monthly workshops. We're partnered with faculty members from Winston-Salem State University, from Forsyth Tech Small Business Center. We've had partnerships with the Wake Forest School of Law Clinic, as well as the city's Small Business Development Department. Um, so we run it like a business. We're trying to run it like a business so that it can be self-sustaining. Um, and as I mentioned, the 34 businesses that are there now do pay a monthly fee um, for their space. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I have another comment. Um, a lot of folks come to us and they say they want to get into a business, but they don't come with any, any plan and sometimes, most of the time, without any money. And I would encourage them, if they want to do, this would be one place they could get their start. Now, a question has come up indirectly about the Hewitt Building. So mm -hmm. we're going to have places to go. Something is going to happen over there soon. And that's where we first got out of the We were one of the first cities to do an incubator business in the city. Mm -hmm. So have you received any questions? We've had several people from the Hewitt Business Center come over and take a look at our uh, just really starting this month. Apparently, they were all given notice recently that they've been put on a month-to-month -month lease over at the Hewitt Business Center, West Salem Square. And so several of them have started looking for places to go, uh, and they have visited us. We only have one so far that, that has um, signed a lease to say that they are actually coming. But that building has probably 60 or 70 businesses in it that will all be ro relocating eventually. And that's the one kind of near the Mount Ram Marshall, Street. right at at Marshall Street. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. We go ahead. We'll do this, but uh, city manager, there are going to be some people. If they don't go there, they may be out of business, and they will need. Uh, I, I don't want to think about downtown when we had small businesses that we went in there and we did what we did, and we really pushed a lot of them out of business. And here's a company now uh, getting ready to go for a business. These people who purchase it may have a different thought of what they want to do with their building is there. And it would be sad to see some of those business people not have to go. Okay, we'll take a look and see what we can do. Right. Um, I, again, I, I'm, I love food. I, anything that has to do with food, and everyone knows that. So any innovative or any type of initiatives that we can you know, implement throughout the city it's a good day in Winston-Salem. Um, I've also heard that there are one or two other uh, commercial or shared kitchens that have been probably coming online, probably the west, north, some others, the south ends of town. So I'm wondering, you know, I know we have a lot of restaurants and things. <clears throat> Will there come a time where this space may not be able to do what we want it to do. As a matter of fact, I passed a business today on Cherry Street. Uh, used to be that specialty place, and they have a, a realtor that's Meridian that's putting that property up to be a commercial 
shared kitchen, and it says it on the sign out front. So I'm wondering, at present, how many people do you anticipate will be coming into this space? So my understanding of how we need to do this to be permitted and keep it uh, correct is you can only have as many chefs using the space as you have storage for those chefs. Our space will only be able to handle five at a time. So once we get five chefs committed to using this space as the primary uh, location for them to prepare food, we can only handle five at a time. Um, I talked with uh, Michelle, can't think of her last name, at the Environmental Health Services Department today. She did tell me that she gets about five calls a day. Uh, we've been in touch with her over time as we've designed the construction drawings for our place. But they are somewhat limited because they're requirements based on how much storage how, and particularly how much refrigeration you have per chef. Correct. So, you know, we can only handle maximum five at a time. Now, when somebody grows, outgrows our place, and they can go get their own restaurant, then we would replace them, replace their slot. But uh, we are going to be uh, limited. And I guess that's what's going to be my next question, uh, the contract for time that these chefs, are allowed to stay there, they'll have a contract. Mm -hmm. And if there's a contract, what is the amount of time that you're seeing them be there? Because it could be a situation, as we all know, that a chef comes and they never leave. I mean, they don't want to leave because of the, you know, mm -hmm. resources and money involved in even getting a food truck or a restaurant or any of that. Mm -hmm. So what is the time that you're looking at on these five people because if the five people come and stay and nobody else can do it, then they got a good deal. You're right. I want some of that. <laughs> <laughs> we typically do 12 month agreements with businesses because that gives us time to, well, first of all, they all have to be um, served safe, certified. Um, we want to make sure that they're completely trained, that they have good menus, that they have that they're offering good products and services and that they all have a business plan and we provide QuickBooks we have QuickBooks training to try to make sure they get the financial end of a startup um, a lot of people think that they're great cooks but everybody's not a great business person so we anticipate giving each chef 12 months okay. and we'll assess uh, their progress okay. thank you um, I have no questions. I just want to say thank you uh, to uh, SG Atkins CDC, to uh, you, Carol, for the great diligence and work that you put in at the CDC. I think that uh, the Enterprise Center is a model entity for not just Winston-Salem, but other opportunities uh, across the state and even in the region in terms of how we are collectively come together to produce something that has great products for citizens and people who want to go into business. As we continue to make these investments, my hope is that uh, these businesses that are there continue to thrive and grow, and that we continue that we see this we see spillage uh, within uh, the Martin Luther King corridor and, and throughout the community because uh, businesses have been given uh, what they need to to shelter in place, grow and scale, and continue to do business in the community. And so, I say thank you, and I'm looking thank forward you. to uh, those who will come in and occupy this space in the building. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to add my uh, uh, support of this as well. Councilmember Baruch, it was 1986. We did that project at the Hewitt Center, and Councilmember Adams is exactly right. We have problems because people stayed there. Maybe some of them still there. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I'm glad that you've yeah. got a little bit of an exit strategy to keep them out. But, you know, we're working hard to create an a, a entrepreneurial ecos ecosystem here in, in Winston-Famous Side County, and the food business is so expensive to get into, as we know. So this will give a, a great opportunity for individuals to get into that and create some opportunities. And uh, the restaurants uh, throughout our city are always looking for good chefs, so for someone to be able to prove their mettle and then move into that is it, good. So I congratulate you on Thank that. Thank you. I think it's a great idea. I know that um, I've got friends who were formerly in the catering business, and historically it's been very, very difficult to find a spot to work out of. Either you hop from church to church, which 
kind of works but kind of doesn't. So there's providing a place where somebody can have a steady resource, I think, is, is really important. The demand side is going to be interesting. If we've got multiple coming up, then uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully there's enough demand to go around to, to fill the supply. Um, I noticed in the in the uh, documentation here that you guys are not going to have to install a grease trap. So apparently there was we a, already have that part that in. There was a facility in there previously that. Was well, we put that in during our last phase of renovation. Okay, um, but this does go to further, I think, a growing sense that Winston Salem is a foodie de destination. Um, we have actually been called that in a couple of magazines, uh, mm -hmm. and not just uh, fly by night magazines, but some fairly good magazines and. I think as Winston sort of recognizes that we're becoming a tourist destination, that the food culture is a big draw for people, as is historic mm -hmm. preservation. And so I think those things combined really help us uh, be somebody on the map and draw, and draw more folks in. Um, just a side note that uh, I was in a business that started out in the Hewitt Center, and we grew eventually to be about a $22 million a year company. <laughs> so we were out of there um, in about two years. So it worked well for us. Uh, just a few questions from the chair. I'm concerned about. Uh, you hit center if if it does change purpose, <coughs> finding homes for those folks. How much spare capacity do you have? You said you had 34 folks there now. How many mm -hmm. more can you take? I think we can do about eight to ten more, and then we. That's we'll, not much. No. Nope. Yeah. There's a there's a private enterprise scenario going on where there is a deal being cooked up to to move people to another location. With similar rents now, I don't know. Okay. I don't. I'm not. I've, I've just heard about it, and I don't know the details of it. Um, but the thought is that taking under an under underutilized space um, and allowing those people to move there at similar rents. Okay. Well, I don't know a whole lot more hear. than that. Yes, yes ma'am. The manager to make sure we get some kind of report so we'll know what's happening. Yeah, and maybe if if you hear more through the grapevine i'll ask those folks to come forward <coughs> and, forward and, and, and maybe plan. uh we could notify the folks in the hewitt center what's available certainly if you've got eight to ten spaces it will not take long to fill that up and i will say as an aside uh i do think this is a great idea i think it's it's further utilization of a building that's already being used uh, i would mention one comment uh, and this is based my wife happens to work at food bank they have the the triad community kitchen there mm -hmm where they train chefs, and I, I, I'm not sure if there's any synergy there, but there might be, mm -hmm. uh, and I would recommend you meet with uh, Jeff Bacon, Jeff Bacon. who's the, you probably already know him. Mm -hmm. uh, but it may be some of his graduates go through there, or vice versa, or whatever it may be, but just, mm -hmm. uh, there's, as you say, there's a lot of synergy that can take place here and, 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 and go further with it. So anyway, I think it's a great idea. Do we have a motion? Thank you. Second. We have a motion to second to approve on G4. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed likewise. That is approved. We'll now go to G5. Item G5, ordinances designating certain property as a historic landmark. The John L. and Emma J. Gilmer House located at 605 West Cas Cascade Avenue and a portion of an, an unopened alley. This item was continued from the September meetings of the Finance and Community Development, Housing and General Government Committees. If y'all can remember, we discussed this at the last meeting and we asked for some different inf inf additional information. Ms. McCullough, I think you provided that in here. Are you going to go over that a little bit? Just a little bit, just very briefly. Very right briefly. Um, again, from our last meeting, you had a number of good questions, a number of good points, and a number of facts that you wanted me to research a little bit. <coughs> also, after that meeting, um, several of you came up to me and said, here's where my real concern lies and, and with those questions. So I want to make sure I hit upon those, and then we'll take any other questions. And we hopefully have a suggestion or something that can get rid of what I'm going to call the heartburn every time one of these single family residents comes up, you know, that that's the best term I can think of. Oh, and I do. Appropriate term. It's appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> and I do want to add, if they need any food tasters, I'm willing to volunteer. Just, just to let you know. <laughs> okay. um, but again, I'm not going to go over all the history of the landmark program itself. But just to just to hit upon one important fact, one of the criteria is, is usually in historic world is these buildings are 50 years old. It's not every building that's 50 years old that's eligible. It really does have to have special significance and integrity. Our new application, which you looked at last month really ups the bar on that we give you have to hit this nut like five out of seven in integrity and you have to you know lisa so and that's what the historic resources commission is there for there to be the the purest in that historic world um again here here it is here's where that burn comes the tax deferral portion just to give you a brief we are um 
one of very few towns, one of three in this state, that's very conservative with this. It is up to 50 percent. And our tax assessor, again, very conservatively says, of only what is designated. Okay, so that's key. Um, and I do want to tell you, we have, we have landmark properties that just the front facade's been designated. So they literally don't get a full 50% where everywhere else in the state, but us three little towns here, um, get a full 50% no matter what's designated. So we do look at it very conservatively. And again, this tax deferral isn't meant to be you know, a gift or a prize or anything. It really is to help with those extra costs because they take on that burden of having to keep that original or historic material. That's what the integrity is about. That's what that great fireplace or stairwell or exterior, you know, the, the slate roof with the cupola and all of that great stuff. They typically, it's not a, it's not a choice for them. They have to get a, a certificate of appropriateness and we typically, we meeting the HRC, make them keep it and make them repair in kind. So just kind of wanted to make sure that point was understood. We've given you big reports before in the past, you know, financial reports on all of the landmarks. I really wanted to needle down into what you were concerned about. And doing some research, I found out there are literally just 17 single family properties that are, you know, lived in by families or an individual or whoever, um, not including Old Salem and Bethabra. They're a different breed. We, you know, they're our museum district, and we kind of get that they're a little bit, they're different. And we're the only ones in the state that have that. So taking them out, um, out of our 134. My next thought then, and your next question, well, what is that tax deferral then for those 17 properties? And it's roughly around 62,000 for all 17 properties. Again, what that is to help them cover though is to, to, to maintain this historic fabric. And so my next thought was, I'll give you some examples of what those costs can be. I contacted a local contractor who has worked on three historic buildings in the last three years, two of which were single family residences originally, and two of which are local landmarks. So had to go through all the hoops and everything. And just to kind of show you on the exterior, a normal person's roof, which is an asphalt shingle roof, can be anywhere from 400 to 450 per square. And a square is 100 square feet. A slate roof can be 1,000 to 1,600. Um, you know, so there, there is a little bit of a difference there. And interior-wise, you even see it there. Take plaster versus drywall. Drywall is about $2 a square foot. Plasters repair, and then putting new plaster up can be 16 to 18. Several other examples that were in your, in your material um, that you can go back and look at too later. But a lot, everything they have to do, people can put vinyl siding on, and that can be an expensive chore to do, but it's a one hit, 25,000. If you have to repaint your house every year, a lot of times you're looking at 25,000 every five years with no lead in our paint anymore. They really have to paint them more than less. One of the most exciting things I found out um, was from Richard Geiger, who's the head of our Visitors Bureau. They had just uh, finished an update. They look at every so many years, they do kind of a tourist and a visitors survey. And he's, they've got this new report out from 2015, 2016, the Visitors Incept Survey. Um, and it's funny, I come right after the food people, but literally in there, one of their headlines on the front page of it is, is what makes us distinct? That's what they wanted to find out. What makes Winston-Salem special? Why are people coming here? And what they use is history, charm, quaint, artsy, downtown, restaurant, atmosphere, vibe, all of those things. That's our vibe. It wasn't really a great grammar sentence, but it's our vibe. And then they said, that is the essence that Winston-Salem needs to protect and preserve. That was their language, not mine. Um, but I thought that was interesting. So then they go through, and it is really a great study if you haven't seen it, because it breaks it down into all the facts and figures and all that. Um, and it has gone up. The visitors that responded said, who comes here just for attractions, museums, historic sites, and wineries? I'm not going to say they might be heavy on the wineries, but we'll, we'll, I'll consider it heavy on the historic sites. But it was 37.1%, you know, and that was up from when they did it last time in 2008. So again, our history is a very big economic driver. Heritage tourism is a very big economic driver. And what we're seeing now, it's not just old Salem. Innovation Quarter has opened up a door to this factory loft. You know, people want to come on tours. People want to come see our neighborhoods. 
and we do tours here for the city for employees and you know and things we we tend to do downtown because it's easy we can meet at city hall and do you know around we did them just last week because it was customer service week you know and we led them and g from marketing and i led tours people said okay now we've done downtown can we get into our neighborhoods we want to learn more about the East and the South and the North. And so we're going to come do two more tours. We get that all the time. So the other questions I heard you say is it sounded like, how do we find out? Do you, does anybody know about these landmarks? I did want you to know that we do have, a, have things out on our website. Each building has a little plaque on that they get when designation occurs. Again, we have information sheets, and I hope you've seen them. But you know, for our marker program and the landmarks, a lot of schools call us and say, do you have any information? We give them these one page, they love it because it's easy. Um, we have an interactive map online that's with the markers and the landmarks that people can go on and find where they are and all that sort of fun stuff. And then during Preservation Month, again, we're trying very hard to get into these buildings to get to different buildings. The Starber Farm, which is out, outside of Bethania but in city limits, has opened their farm up twice because May's a great time because the baby lambs are there. Kids love it. It's a great family day, and it's an you know, 1870s house, you know, Greek Revival home. So, and again, the year we did the trolley tour, I still get calls. When are you go doing it again? And I said, well, I'm hoping somebody's taking that business over. So, um, again, we want to keep doing that. After this meeting, planning staff, the attorney staff, we, we were brainstorming. We again started it in this meeting, and we thought of other ideas to make um, these landmarks a little more visible, especially the ones that give you the heartburn. Um, maybe, you know, in the right of way, not putting up big markers like we have, but maybe, you know, like the black, the brown and white ones you see about heritage sites and so something smaller that lets people know this is a landmark site. It is the F. Scott Fitzgerald House, you know, that sort of thing. I've talked to the Segway people. The Gilmore House, which is the one that's in limbo right now, it actually is on their tour. And imagine they could create a stop for that then. And, and we could continue doing things like that around the community with these and help encourage more in all parts of the community. Um, again, the 3D tours, you know, that we could put online. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a second. And then, um, again, continuing to do tours and events of these. We also have started, and we did this in the county for our residents, giving that plaque that they get at the meeting People cried and laughed. I told you about that. The biggest thing we came to a consensus with after that meeting, after meeting with attorneys to make sure everything was okay, was how can we make this easier for you? You know, when these marker applications come to you and it's, it's your, your decision to review and approve or deny them. So what we've done, and you saw it in your package, the state statute said the HRC and you are, are there for the education, pleasure, and enrichment of residents. I heard loud and clear. We don't know if we're really getting that from some of these. So the questions I heard after that you want added were things like, would the applicant be willing to open their house or building? Would the applicant be willing to have it photographed? Has it been restored recently or rehabbed? How much did that cost? Is it going to be restored? What's your estimated cost? Is it for sale? So what we did was create that one page sheet that was in your packet. And originally we thought we'd add that to the application. Um, and so it would go to the HRC, then come here. I took it to the HRC for review at the October 5th meeting. They have great concern. Um, again, they're our group that's supposed to be looking at it for that preservation, for the historic value, that significance and integrity, and they take it very seriously. They think getting numbers and things like that, that's not what they were set to do. They're, you know, given that when it comes to you guys, you're allowed to ask more questions than they can. So again, we went to Angela and she helped us and we said, how about if we make it a city council questionnaire? So they'll go through the HRC and they'll do the application and they will be able to do their job like they're supposed to and they make their recommendation to you. Once it gets in that process, staff meets with, the applicant has them fill out and sign this other, and makes that part of your packet. So it will then be presented with you with your information when it comes to committee and then to the um, full, full council. So in conclusion, really, what it does is all of that information, the staff packet, the new questionnaire, can help you ensure that you're giving the city the education, pleasure, and enrichment to all the residents, plus giving fair tax deferrals, where you feel that, that is, that's being met. Um, and then you have the opportunity to do really one of four things. 
One is to approve the whole thing as it was applied for, interior, exterior, site, whatever. You can make changes at that point. You can say, we feel the exterior should be designated and move that forward and remove a portion of it, like the interior or the site. Say you see there's an issue with the site for some reason. Um, you can also say, we see that the exterior should be, and we get that the Jeffersonian stairwell should be included, and that, that's it. Or you can deny it. So that after taking your questions, that's kind of where we left off, hopefully giving you a tool, if you approve of it, um, to use in the future. Any questions for Ms. McCall? Ms. Burke? I'm just going to make a comment. I do appreciate what you do. Thank you. And you get excited to really ask them about what you're mm -hmm. doing. And, uh, I think that's something. And me being on the tourism authority, it is important for us to have something for people when they come to this city. And some people just like to throw a That's the thing. And one other thing, when you mentioned uh, Mr. McIntosh concerning the food, uh, that was done, and that report can be gotten from the Mr. Guy, so he can share it with our folks. They went to a good place to have good food, restaurants, and we made a tremendous turnaround. Good. We won't come back to it. And that's one thing that they do have to make the store at home. Yes, ma'am. Any other? Go ahead, Ms. Yes. Um, Ms. McCullough, I saw on one of the pages of the report mm -hmm. that it said um, that they're responsible to ensure that the house's features are retained, mm -hmm. historical features are retained. Yes. Who monitors that to ensure that the features are retained? The Historic Resource Commission is charged with that duty, so it would be staff and the Historic Resource Commission. And that's part of the... Um, I would say, I'm going to use the term due diligence, it's probably not the right term, but that we've been going through in the last two years to find out how we can better do that. Um, really reaching out and, and staying in contact with them and, you know, making sure they, they know we haven't forgotten them and that we want, you know, to make sure. So it was, so it's us. I am truly hoping that we do figure out a way that we could reach some agreement with the homeowners like I know that to put up 61,000 a lot of people would think well that's nothing but it's a lot uh, considering the requests that we get all the time and there are some that's you know way smaller than that that we can't do so I feel compelled that again for me to truly buy into this a hundred percent We've got to figure out a way to make that education, pleasure, and enrichment for the residents of the city come to fruition. I know it's good that we got tourism, but it wouldn't exist without the citizens of Winston-Salem right. paying the tax dollars. So out-of-towners, we love you. They come here. They spend their money. But that's part of being in a city or a town. You're supposed to be able to reap some of that pleasure as well that others reap. So. I, 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 that's where I am right now on that. Ms. Montgomery, I mean, uh, yes, you have a comment? I do. Um, I, I'm glad for the uh, follow-up and input and uh, some of the pieces we've seen today. On the, um, the questionnaire piece and mm -hmm. um, where it is in the, in the cycle, um, whether here at council or at the HRC, um, I may sound like Riley when I make this comment, but HRC uh, is an entity that is established by local government entities for this work. And so I think it would be important for the HRC to know if that these are things that we're asking about that I think is good when, that those things are considered uh, on the front end instead of kind of inserted in the middle of it from a different place. And, and, and in that consideration, in that conversation, um, I'm not sure if there's something legally that prohibits that from being a consideration at that time. And if so, that's something good to know. Um, if it's not, then, you know, is that something, some type of information that does come in the beginning that really frames a picture from the onset of what, what the total picture is and what we're looking at. Um, second piece, and you may have an answer on this, on that. Uh, second piece is like with the dollar amount <laughs> that we're looking at in total, um, about $60,000, 17 properties. Um, and looking at where most of these properties are located and 
many are in affluent neighborhoods and the average income in those areas are much higher than in many other uh, communities and so people who are living in those uh, in those homes often have higher level of resources to do the type of work in these properties than in some other parts of the community that have just as rich historic properties uh, but may not have uh, the resources to maintain them at a level that makes them the jewels that they have in community. And if you take, for instance, $60,000 on an annual basis, that every year we decided $60,000 is going to be invested in a historic property that meets X amount of things, and we we're going to invest this to help this property be restored. In 20 years, you, you have 20 properties that have, the, that have had this opportunity of investment to maintain certain historic character and things in it. So I'm, I, I think we, we continue to look at it. Um, uh, and for me, I, I don't have this question when we're talking about uh, adaptive reuse and, and how we, we uh, take properties in, um, that have historic nature and use them and, and help cut the cost, because I just, I think we see the larger impact. Um, but even with these, I, I, still, I, I still have some uh, reservations, but I think it moves in the right direction and um, you know, uh, gets to a place of, of a, a better sense of that community being pulled into these properties and how we understand that rich history, because as it is now, I see history in other parts of the community not being preserved the same way because of the fact of very much more of an income challenge in the areas where these properties exist. Um, so I, that's one of, one of our challenges. If we want to be about historic preservation in, in, throughout the entire city, how does the program impact truly across the board on preserving that rich culture and history? Um, throughout the entire community. And, you know, I, I know that's not the basis of this full conversation, but that's where my thoughts go in when we're, when we're thinking about it and why I have the type of questions I have when these come up. Can I answer your first question so I don't forget? Mm -hmm. I'm getting older every day. There's no legal, and Angela's shaking her head, there's no legal reason to move it. Um, the HRC, we left it that it would probably still be part of their application, and then we met with Angela and I met with Paul, and, and actually Councilperson McIntosh was at that HRC meeting that night, so he might want to chime in to give some, some other insight on the HRC. Um, it's not um, that I don't, we don't want to share that with them, it's that I really do think that they have, um, and I'm going to use purists because I'm not thinking of a better word right now, but in the, in the enabling legislation that they're given, they really are to make the decision based on special significance and integrity. And those other things like um, money, where it is, that sort of thing, they really are just looking at the building and its importance to our culture. And if we lost that building, how would it not, how, how would we suffer from that not telling that part of the story? Now, I understand though that we are lacking in certain wards having some of these. And, and you're right, and that's, that's on my radar. Um, I'd love to have more time to kind of pull, pick certain brains to find out. I know you guys have probably certain, you're thinking of one right now, probably. You know, and I'd love to, hey, can we talk about that? Because we, we wait for people to bring these applications to us. And so sometimes we do have to massage that and go meet with Mr. Smith, who has this house, and it's a bit of history I might not even know. And that's a problem, there's probably a lot out there, but. But we might have to massage those. So again, um, I am aware of that, and we are going to try to work on that and how to how to do that. And so, if you have ideas, we'd love to hear it, um, and and look at that further. So, just yeah, and, I, and I'll, that's a comment I'll let uh, won't over discuss it. Uh, but I, I'm sure Ms. Burke and others in community who've seen over years in in different parts of of the city where historic sites that existed before don't exist today and all we have is photographs yeah. to, to showcase those those locations in our communities. And so we take 100 years from now these properties that have been preserved and they've only been preserved in certain parts of our community. That doesn't tell the full story of our community. And so, you know, we think about the fullness of community and fullness of, of retaining history. It has to be our history as a whole if we're going to truly retain it. And we want people to reflect back and look and see the whole of the, the comprehensive picture, picture. not just certain parts of it. So yeah. I, I, we have to think of that. Uh, Mr. McIntosh was next. And I'll get you. At, at, at the HRC meeting, I, it, was, it was evident, and, and I know there was a lot of conversation, and if, I don't want to say controversy, but heartburn may be a better word, about the concept of um, public access. And HRC, I think, is looking to counsel to help define that. 
And I don't think there's any reservation on HRC's part um, to come up with some sort of a uh, schedule. And, and I think it's going to be some collaborative brainstorming session. The question about policing, um, you know, the work, has it changed over time? I mean, you know, maybe combine that with, with a public access. You know, is it once every year, once every five years, or some, some regular set schedule that you come back and you look at these things, and at the same time you, take, you take, use that advantage to, to have people come in the house? Um, it, every time there's a historic property tour, whether it's the George, George Black House or Washington Park yeah. has theirs, you know, the, the public flocks to those things. And it is an advantage that Winston-Salem has that other, other communities don't. We were the largest city in the state until 1941. We have the largest grouping of historic properties in, in the state. So it's, 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 a, it's a treasure that, that once it's gone, is gone. As you said, you know, there are buildings all over town that I know that have come down that I'd love to have back. Um, so I think the challenge isn't so much the landmark issue. I, th I think we can work through that. The challenge to me is how to come up with strategies to preserve properties in other parts of the city. Because you're right. I mean, you know, Walltown, the Walltown section, Reynolds Town, Patterson. I, mean, I, I can just roll through them. North Cherry. I mean, there's just so many. There's so much architecture that needs to be saved. The question is how do you come up with a strategy to do that? And I, th this is a tool that you can use occasionally, but it's not going to fit all situations. Historic, historic tax credits is, is a tool. Um, the make and model is a tool. I mean, there are conversations we need to have about how to how to accomplish that. And I think it's really important that we do that all over the city, not just in um, the affluent neighborhoods. Ms. Uh, Burke, you had your hand up. I was going to say uh, the conversation that Mr. Uh, Montgomery brought to the attention. I've been in this conversation about this same subject, and uh, much as I appreciate Ms. Uh, McCall, when you say that you want to hear, well, some of us who are not sitting here also presented to that department on what we felt that you ought to do because it's a shame when you look in this list and you have only one house. George Black. And that has a lot to be done. Yeah. And then uh, I was with the city manager on uh, Friday and I was telling Mr. Shane on the same subject. I said, up here near the Greenway, Oklahoma, oh, yeah. Montrose. Oh, yeah. And I asked the city to go there and look at some of those houses. And then what you bring up about 25th, Cherry, Patterson. There are still some houses if we, if we can get to those uh, landlords. So even yeah. in the real estate business, get a hold of them, and that's when they become slum pieces of property. But I think it's something that needs to be, Mr. City Manager, given attention, not just talking and back and forth. I started with Ms. Keaton with the same stuff, and I think I had to the board of them with that section. I was told there was no historical. Oh, I know. I totally agree with you about Bonaire Green. I've had the state here three times to look at that for National Register. I love that area because the architecture, again, we, we can't lose that. And right now it's actually affordable housing that has hardwood floors, mantles. I mean, these, so I would love to, yeah, we, but I think we need another tool. Um, I don't know, because we could help one or two houses in that neighborhood, but it's a neighborhood that needs a tool. So. Okay. Any other questions, comments? I'll just offer a few. First off, I appreciate your comments. They were very thoughtfully done uh, and, and um, were helpful for me. Uh, I'd like to just offer two comments. One, I think I have one. There's three in the West Ward. And I have one that's down a private road that I have never seen because I honor the sign that's in front of the road that says private road. I don't go down it. Your tax dollars. So I do think one of the criteria should be not so much touring the in, inside you of the house, but at least you ought to be able to drive by it. And it's uh, Philip Haynes' old house. On, uh, oh, mm -hmm. <coughs> and I always assumed I'd get shot if I drove down there, so I've never been down <laughs> it. Um, I would be surprised, I, I tell you where I'm, and I have gone both ways on this, and I think that probably shows my struggle with this issue. How do you uh, do it appropriately? And I do think there have been some good comments made here. One is even with this credit, if you've already put a, a vinyl siding on your house, it's too late. Or you replace the windows with, you know, vinyl windows or whatever. Well, City Hall's not, City Hall's a landmark. We replaced our windows. So we, we they do make some. I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. So sometimes even a 50% tax credit uh, yeah. will not do it. And I'll also say, and I do know the three houses in the West Ward at least, I don't think the tax value is appropriate. I don't think they would sell for anywhere near that, given what I know about them. 
Uh, but I do like the idea of, of an exterior uh, restriction because that's mostly what we do. We do not tour these houses, but we do drive by them. And uh, so I would be supportive of this particular one for an exterior only designation. I don't know where everyone else is falling. I've heard lots of comments here. Does anyone want to? May I also say the owner of that home is here at the meeting tonight. If you have any, if you want to hear from an owner's perspective, but that's just to let you know. I don't want it. Want okay. Well, he'd like to come up and say a few words. That would be fine. I didn't know he was here. Sir, please you? come on up. We'd invited you early if we'd known you were here. My name is Richard Sickles, and I'm the owner of the proud owner of the Gilmer home. And um, I know a lot of people look at my home and big homes, and they say, oh, that person's a wealthy person, and they don't need a tax break, and this and that and the other. Uh, I take great pride in that home, and it's about a three and a half acre estate, actually. And my water bill alone for the last three months is more than my yearly tax bill just to irrigate the property and keep it looking, you know, in the shape that I'm going to keep it in. And also, I think that if you're familiar with my home, the way it sits up on the hill over Washington Park, it's a very public, uh, it almost commands the park. Uh, you can see it in the wintertime from the whole other side of the park. If you look through the park, you can see my house sitting up on the hill. Uh, it's something that I would just like to preserve for future generations. And uh, I hope that you people will, will see it that Thank way, too. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone on the council that would like to make a motion on this? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Perkins. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I, if you did, I, I didn't hear it. Okay. All right, we have a motion. Uh, now, is there actually a motion in here that we can... No, I think it's... There's a resolution. It's information. Mm -hmm. All right, let me just be sure everybody knows where it is. It's on page... looks like it's page uh, 41. It will be going to your meeting on Monday. So this would be a recommendation from the committee, right? To the yes, that's right. It's on page 41 is what Ms. Burke is, is seconding. Is there a second to it? Did I, did I make the right motion? Please. I'm sure that you uh, made a motion to um, move forward or to approve the ordinance on page 41 of the general And I get that motion. And I'll, I'll second it. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, abstaining or you're opposing? So we have two in favor and two opposed. Madam Attorney, did we send it forward with two and two? You mm -hmm. send it forward without. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you, sir. That, so it will be on the agenda Monday night uh, down the hall at 7 o'clock. Thank you, ma'am. We have one more item left, and that is G6. The Secretary will read that, please. Item G6, information on Winston-Salem Lake YW, YMCA, located in the East Ward. Mr. Page, would you introduce this to us? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Chairman Clark and members of the Finance Committee. Um, this item is really staff seeking direction from the Finance Committee and Council regarding a proposal that has been made to the city from the YMCA of Northwest North Carolina. We've been in contact with the YMCA for several months now. And um, I'll go on and state that I actually do have three people here, Mr. Kurt Hazelbaker, Mr. Daryl Head, and Mr. Richard Daniels from the YMCA to answer questions at the appropriate time. But um, they've approached the city about the possibility of selling the Winston Lake YMCA to the city of Winston-Salem for $1. And that they would then in turn lease back from the city for $1 per year up to 50 years with a minimum of five years, a portion of the facility. The facility would, uh, as far as that portion of the facility, be about 8,300 feet that would be used out of a 50,000 square foot facility that would be sort of an express YMCA. They would have things such as a weight room, adult locker rooms, whirlpool, sauna, steam room um, within the facility. 
the city would operate the rest of the facility and use it for special population and senior programming, um, things such as the Senior Olympics, the Special Olympics and Senior Games will be held there as well as our ongoing programming for special populations and seniors. The facility at, uh, itself is about 35 years old, does have some deferred maintenance or some maintenance needs that have been identified that in the next three to five years will have to be addressed. Those expenses will be somewhere in the neighborhood of about one and a quarter to one and a half million dollars for things such as a new roof, HVAC, chillers, and flooring in the facility. Um, the facility itself has a value of just under four million dollars. So it, it is a tax or a facility that has a fairly significant value but does require some maintenance in the very near future. We did do a walkthrough at the facility last week, um, both staff from Recreation and Parks as well as Property and Facilities Management did a walkthrough of the facility and have not identified any major issues outside of those that have already been sort of mentioned, the roof, HVAC, chillers, flooring, those types of things. The facility itself, as far as operational expenses, would have an estimated annual operating expenses for utilities and maintenance of about $250,000 to $275,000 per year. Right now, if the city were able to acquire the facility, we wouldn't recommend any additional program until we can get in the facility and figure out what the actual best uses of the facility are, but um, there may be a need at some point in the future to add some additional staffing for both programming and well as possible aquatics programs that could be offered at the facility. So there's no additional staffing anticipated in the short term, but could be some in the long term for the facility. As I mentioned, um, I do have Mr. Kurt Hazelbaker the president and CEO of the facility, as well as Daryl Head, COO of the facility, and Richard Little, who I believe is executive director of this facility and one other facility with the Y, could ask any questions. At this point, we're really just seeking direction from the finance committee as the next steps. Is this something that council would be interested in um, city staff and to have conversations with YMCA about and bring an item for it? forward in the upcoming months. I will mention that the YMCA board has met on this concept and has endorsed it, as well as there have been meetings with the uh, Winston Lake board, and I think the Winston Lake board has also been, the information has been shared with the Winston Lake um, board members about the possibility of this um, transition. If I have to answer any questions as we go forward. I can ask, and I see Mr. Hazel Baker on the front row. Whoever from the Y would like to make a little comments, and then we'll open up for questions. That's all right with everybody. Sure. Thank you. I'm Kurt Hazel Baker. If you give your name and address for the record, please. Kurt Hazel Baker, 6800 uh, Double Gate Drive in Clemens. Um, the we have operated the Y since 1985 in that site. Previously, it was the Patterson Avenue YMCA. Since it's opened. Uh, in 1985, we've subsidized that Y every year since it's been opened. It's, uh, it meets a community need, uh, but it's been challenged to operate as far as membership support, program revenue. So we subsidize it uh, annually about, the last five years it's averaged about $330,000. Um, so it's the Y we invest the most of our resources into on an ongoing basis of the 16 we've got. And so we've been looking for years to see if there's a way to make a partner with an other entity that can bring some other groups into it and uh, began the discussion. We've had several discussions with the city over the year about interest in it. Council Member Montgomery uh, has embraced the idea of this time going forward with it and we think it makes sense to partner with the city. We keep a presence in Winston, East Winston with the YMCA. Uh, we like the idea of bringing other uh, groups into the building. 
building's really too big for what we need. It's 50,000 square feet. It's one of our larger facilities. We just don't need that much square footage um, to serve the membership of the programming base that, that uh, use that line. Thank you. Now, are there any questions, comments for anyone? Ms. Uh, Adams. Yes. Um, um, <laughs> I don't know where to start. Um, I did talk to the city manager about this, and I did request certain pieces of information that are not here, and I, I'll, I'll go with the fact that you said that you're going to be sending us more information. Uh, I think, and maybe I, I'm wrong, I, I don't know, I've been a member of the Y since the, practically all my life, whether it was at Patterson and when the facility was built at Winston Lake, and then I was at Kernersville, then I was downtown at Central for a while, and now I'm, I'm kind of at Fulton. But I'm going to tell you, I used to go to the Y every day. And at that time in my life, it was a needed necessity for me. It gave me a break from my work world to, to rejuvenate and things. But the one thing I found out for me as the years have gone by, the 40-something years I've been a member, it kind of lost its, I don't want to say, it lost its glimmer for me in that like consumers, you become more educated as to what you need. And I always felt like the why, and this is no whatever to the why, this is just me and a whole lot of other people I talk to, and a lot of seniors and people. We find benefit at other places and other resources versus the why. And my only concern and issue with the why as a member that's still paying is that I don't think you you basically changed your footprint over the year to compete with the all the new gyms and all of the other things that go on no different than any brand or project. That's what I think. Um, I also have an issue like I asked staff to give me the financial data for the past five years of the maintenance of that Y, uh, for the repairs, for the memberships. Uh, how do they benchmark up against the other counties y w y m c a s um, utility cost the pool will the kids in the neighborhood be able to swim free if we let you lease and we do our thing with it because we're building and I can't remember parks people what we're building at the winston lake uh park area uh what all is into that, not the winston lake why but what all is into that so far as water features are concerned. I mean, don't get me wrong, I think what we're doing over there is great, but for those of you that sat in on that meeting with 102 residents Thursday night, this is what I have to now, I gotta still go deal with that, that they can say, you're doing this when you can't figure out how to get our deal fixed out here in Bethania. So uh, with that to say, like the Black Phillips building, the Black Phillips Smith building, that building was there when my parents bought their first house in 1964. I had my first checking account there as a 17-year-old or something. But that was a staple in that community and goes back to the historical pieces earlier that we were talking about. When you start to retract and take away historical institutions in poor neighborhoods, African-American neighborhoods, Latino, Hispanic neighborhoods now, then you take something away that that neighborhood would never be able to get that back unless somebody comes along with a checkbook and says, we'll put it back. The library, the southeast side, that's not there in your neighborhood. The police station, you know, Salem Creek, Salem Lake, the quarry, all of this stuff. All I can tell this council, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the pocketbook, we need to now start looking, and I've mentioned this to some of you. I, I would be the first to say, I want everything that I want in the North Ward. My North Ward people feel like I have neglected them. But when we start taking on things like this and some other things we're doing, I'm not saying it's not good for the community, but this is where we get in trouble because we haven't looked at it from a business model and a perspective of citizen needs model. Uh, Personally, again, I have concerns. I know that the neighborhood has been up in arms and want people to, wanted the city. I admire the council member for bringing this forward. But again, like I said, I know what the wise look like. And I know what went wrong there from a business model. 
And us coming in with the Band-Aid, it may not be the fix. So, you know, until I get my other information, I got some real concerns about this. Again, are my children going to be able to come in and swim every day, all day in my old picture? You know, if I'm owning the building, whatever it is, and this membership, maybe it's just for that part that you're going to control, and then we got the part we're going to control, and I'm looking at the conflict of interest. I know I believe in us being partners with the chair, with private sector and public, but there's some things got to be really worked out in this field. I just it's got a lot of moving parts, Councilmember Montgomery. Okay. But we talked about it. Ms. Burke, you did. Yes, thank you. I, I've sat with some of the citizens concerning it, and I am the first to say that it is not a first class uh, mm -hmm. facility. And when I spoke, to, and I'm going to ask a question because at one of the meetings you did give a report, and I see Mr. Daniels is here. I, uh, and I talked to some of the people. I said, Why do you go to that Y? Well, some can't go in other places, they say. And then the Y talks about they don't have the membership. What well, I want to tell you, there are some people younger than me and older than me and my age who worked as many years as I worked, and I carry home a certain amount of money, but they carry much less home. But they still want to exercise. They still want to be able to go to a place. And I said, uh, I, I don't know if the city takes on the responsibility I don't know what we're going to be doing. Are we going to say now we're going to send our senior uh, department there, our special population, and then the kinds of things that they were getting at the Y, that would be for everybody to participate. As the councilwoman said, it has not really been worked out so we can have a clear understanding of what is going to happen. Uh, I, I did not like uh, when I attended, and I have a relationship with the head over there, and uh, but I didn't like the some of the things and you, you meant well. I do believe that you did. But when you made your uh, presentation to the individuals, as if though you just threw them under the, under, the, under the bus, as some say, it wasn't as sensitive. And I said to several people when they said about your remarks, I said, well, you know, I have a nice relationship with him. From the time he came here, I said, well, maybe he was so frustrated talking about the, the price of that top floor uh, not being able to pay the bills for that floor and not having the air up there. Did you talk about that some, that top floor? What, why weren't you able to keep that open? You had to close it because you said uh, the dance group left and they could not, uh, they well, were we, no longer using it? We hadn't closed any part of the facility yet. We had a dance group that was in the facility renting from us. They outgrew it, and they, she has her own building now. She used to work for us. Upstairs, we have some of our staff. The only program we, we do up there is we have a group exercise room where we do classes upstairs, and then we have a, uh, our child care services branch offices upstairs. So nothing's closed yet. We were talking, I think, when you were there about potentially closing the pool, and we wanted to see where the dis discussion went with the city and looked at opportunities. So the building still functions. Everything's still open as it has been since the building did open. I have friends who go there every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they even talk about the pool, and they will get into that pool, and that pool has not been warm like it should be. And it, it really, it, it, the sanitation will give you a fairly small home. People get in, and I ask them, why do you get into that pool if you know it's not like it ought to be? Oh, I'm telling the truth. You know, they tell me everything about <laughs> what's going on. But what I'm saying is this. It, and I was Mr. Daniels' counselor. You know, I love him. No she knows everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to tell the truth about all of us, myself included. I tell everybody, I'm going to tell about me and I'm going to tell about you. And then I don't have headaches. I just go about my business in heart, as somebody was saying. But it, I, when you look at that, the senior citizens, when we park there, we have to park way down there. If we don't get a space, they didn't even allow for us to become my age. Uh, there's no place you can park in the front. There's no parking. So if the city's going to take on this responsibility, we're going to have a big job to do to make it right for the citizens because they will look to us as not doing what we ought to do. And I know it's something that's needed. Now, I'm, we need, they have no other place to go. I said, why don't you go to Paul Fulton? It's nice, ground level. 
No, they said it's closer. Gas costs money. Mm -hmm. And we, the membership, would you address the membership uh, again? What were you saying about the membership? Uh, you don't have the members. What were you saying? The, the facility doesn't have enough membership revenue to support the cost to operate the facility. A couple of points, I think, based on the, the points Councilman Member Adams made and that you made, uh, Council Member Burks, we've invested over $800,000 into the facility in the last five years. Uh, Roof, roof, HVAC equipment, pool, pool equipment, paint, flooring. What else am I missing, Daryl? Handicap doors. doors. It's got automatic doors now. We've invested that. Um, we have a lot of pool work. And to your point, the pool was inspected last week, and, 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 and we get expected every year. It passed inspection last week when it, when it came in. The facility has about 1,800 members. About 72% of those are seniors. And so it's very much a senior facility. Um, uh, WISTA, there's a lot of people that come to the Y through the Transit Authority. 60% of our membership is third-party payer. That means the insurance company pays their membership. So we get paid when that individual comes in, they scan their card, and then we get paid by the insurance company. So 60% of that membership is from an insurance company. The average member on that third party comes three and a half times a month. So we collect about ten and a half dollars per member. So our goal is to get the people to come in to use the facility more. Um, the, um, we have, Council Member Adams, to your point, we change programming frequently at all of our facilities to see what's current, what's vibrant, as far as the different classes and things like that. So cycle classes, some of our personal training, that's been new over the last few years to meet the needs of, uh, meet the changing needs of our membership. So we try to address those. Um, when, we, when we are aware of new things, we implement new things. Uh, Mr. Montgomery, and Mr. Mack. Yeah, uh, first I want to say that um, I think what initial conversations happened in terms of community uh, kind of engaging me in this process. It, Kurt and I probably over the last couple of years have had different conversations with folks from the Y will reach out and and when something's happening and you know try to get some clarity on what's going on, what's happening. But the most recent piece came around the pool and it was conversation is the pool going to close? What's going to happen with the pool? Um, and the initial conversations were well how can, is there an opportunity to partner? We're doing an aquatic center down the street. Is there an opportunity for something to happen in terms of partnership? And in that evaluation initial conversation it didn't seem uh, to to be something that that would work per se, uh, but the community um, and others very much in a statement of wanting to make sure that there is a presence of the Y in the community, um, and and being able to do that. How does that work? Um, and this type of potential partnership is not something that is abnormal within these type of facilities. And uh, it would be helpful, Kurt, if you send some of the other um, examples uh, mm -hmm. in, in our communities in terms of how how this works with partnership with community, with other communities on uh, the city or government entity being a landlord in essence, not actually running the, the Y facilities, but being a landlord mm -hmm. um, and then allowing for the Y to, uh, to do their work in the particular portions of the building. Um, and, and you hit on a couple of things I wanted to, you to bring up in reference to uh, one thing about if you go to the, to the Winslake Y, uh, you probably would not say, okay, there's not a whole bunch of people because you always see people in there. Um, but one of the things is that in terms of when you see the number of people and the type of membership, as you stated, that exists there in the comparative to those who play a full membership at the Winslet Lake Y compared to those individuals who are in that, um, that senior, senior pay bracket who, you know, don't, don't pay the same amount as somebody like myself who would mm -hmm. pay a full membership. I wouldn't get a benefit of the of seeing discount. I hadn't earned that yet. No. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but that makes a big difference in terms of when you're looking at operating a facility and the dollars that come into the facility. Um, and, and so when you look at that area, um, and if, if the Y didn't exist there, and you, you would create, it would be a vacuum uh, mm -hmm. for the east northeast area of our community in terms of opportunities for that type of facility to exist. And my thought is this, is that the city of Winston-Salem is not a Y. And that is not our best practice of operation of what we mm -hmm. do. And so if, we, if there are people in the community who do it well, how do we work in partnership with them to make sure that that is still offered to our community and is offered in, in a way 
that is preserved and unique and making sure that we don't have this emptiness in parts of our communities that we know have health challenges mm -hmm. and, and need these type of facilities. Um, and I also know that, you know, the Y, like many others, have been impacted by some of the way that um, United Way has changed some of their funding. And again, having to relook at how you do what you do mm -hmm. with the dollars that are coming into the organization. And so that's another impact that, uh, that is within the organization itself. Um, I think, again, the, the Y has done a good job over the last few years in terms of reaching out to the community and summer swimming and, and making sure that communities that need access are, are being able to partner. Um, Rolling Hills, for instance, in terms of summer swim program to get children out of the Rolling Hills to go in and have the opportunity to go to the Y and to swim and to have access there, um, I think are, are things that we speak of that are well. Now, don't get away from the, the fact that there will be a potential additional um, uh, financial burden for the city and being ownership of the property. Mm -hmm. But what happens over the course is that, in essence, this property becomes park property again. It, 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 it becomes back uh, a part of, of, of the park roads and property, but then also is, is offering the opportunity for asset uh, to remain in the community uh, and then also um, being able to make sure that um, some of the needed investments will take place. I know there's something here about the, the why making an investment in the area, um, and so could you speak any more sure. in terms of what that type of investment would be for the why in the area that they would use within, that you all will use in the facility? Yeah, um, and thank you for that. A couple of things I want to cover, and I'll, I'll get to that. We're not going anywhere. We're, we, we've been in Winston-Salem since 1888. This is an opportunity to keep us, keep that presence in that facility for the long term. Uh, Thurwick said 50 years. We hope it's 100 years. That's the initial agreement that we have talked about. So we're not going anywhere. To your point, there are similar arrangements around the country with cities and YMCAs who have agreements in place. Locally, we manage a portion of the Stokes County Recreation Department. So they contract with us. We manage a portion of their, uh, their uh, recreation uh, offerings. Uh, where these have taken place, Orlando, Fort Worth, Austin, are three cities I'm familiar with, with relationships that have been in place. Um, financial assistance is available to our members, so we no one's turned away due to an inability to pay. We have financial assistance available. Um, and to your point on United Way, Winston, Winston Lake used to get $363,000 worth of United Way support. With the changes United Way made, that's down to $200,000 uh, as of this year. So they've changed their direction for that. To the investment back into the facility, in the 8,300 square feet we're going to keep, we're going to invest somewhere between one hundred and fifty dollars and $200,000 into that space. The equipment at Winston Lake, the strength equipment, the cardio equipment is as current as every other facility in our system. All that cardio equipment is on lease. So that's turned over every three years. The strength equipment was replaced about five years ago. The strength equipment typically lasts for us for a while, seven to 10 years. So we, are we would replace all of that and then invest into the space that we would keep. And to Council Member Burke's point, um, there's a lot to work out. You know, this is the preliminary discussion of this piece. You talked about pool usage. Um, there are lots of things to work out with pool and gyms, what time you would operate the facility. We would operate the facility basically like a Y, open at uh, 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the morning and likely go till about 8 o'clock at night. The city facility, city facility portion, now there's a lot to work out with that. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, um, I think Council Member Adams, the the Y is a social place. If you come to any of our branches, uh, you'll see our lobbies and sometimes are just as busy as what's happened in the Wellness Center, and that's at any one of them. We have free coffee at all of them. We, people come in, and that's why they're there. You know, the treadmill is the secondary thing. It's the coffee and the fellowship. The senior centerpiece and the special needs, there's more people who will come to that facility, and it makes it much more of a community facility. And so we, we like that, are intrigued by that, and we think that's a great opportunity for a partnership for both of us. Mr. McIntosh, and then I'll get back. Yep, you'll have to excuse me. I just attended a capital budget um, workshop down in the uh, eastern part of the state with the School of Government. Does this is this in our capital plan anywhere? No. Even though it's a dollar purchase, we've got a million to minimum probably staring us in the face. I mean, this is a capital outlay that it we're looking at. It would have to go into, to, we, we wouldn't need the money immediately, but over the next three years, the estimate is we'd need that full million and a half to do those renovations and upgrades. Okay. My concern is both that and then also the, 
what would be an operating deficit on it year after year after year. Um, we have just spent a lot of money to create new parks, um, and those all have maintenance costs and ongoing uh, dollars associated with them. Somebody needs to show me the, the numbers of how we could absorb this along with the other um, expansions that we've just made in our park system. Ms. Burke, yes. Well, we did what we did out there with the Y and with the town park. We have in that park like the, where you can play football, basketball, mm -hmm. or whatever, baseball, tennis. Mm -hmm. That was supposed to be a comprehensive recreational area. There are some people will have no other place to go but there. Mm -hmm. But the thing that it should be, it should be as first class as it can be. Mm -hmm. So when they do go there, they can feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. that this is the place. Now, a lot of my friends go there, and when they go, I say, now, what did y'all do at school today? <laughs> <laughs> Who did you, what happened over the weekend? And they enjoy it. They just enjoy it, even though the conditions are not like they ought to be. And that's why I'm saying if the city's going to have anything to do with this, we need to do everything that we can do to make parking more accessible. And we need to make sure that the place is Sometimes it's a little too cool, some say, and some say it's a little too hot. I don't know. I don't go there every day. Okay. Uh, Mr. Taylor, I was just handing out and I'm trying to translate it. Go ahead. It's quite all right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I just want to commend you for taking a detailed look at this item. I, I always like to sit and listen methodically before I make comments or make a decision. And I will say I think this is something that warrants a further look. So I'm not on the committee, but I'd ask that you move it forward for consideration. I do have some concerns. I think Mr. Hazelbaker mentioned that uh, they subsidize this particular program at a rate of about $330,000 a year. As Mr. McIntosh mentioned, has been mentioned, how do we absorb that cost? Secondly, I think it is no secret that in East Winston, the YMCA is definitely an anchor uh, even my mother, when she retired from running a small business, she was a aerobics instructor for 10 years. So it means a lot to the community. And it's important that we keep it there in terms of economic development and health disparities. One of the things that I've consistently had a problem with is asking taxpayers to play twice. I know some of you have heard my concerns when we talk about the budget. You know, some of our rec centers, you know, they subsidize our rec centers, but we also ask a fee to play basketball and some of the other sports. I've just got a fundamental problem with asking taxpayers to pay twice. So how do we look at that? What is the fee schedule? What is it going to look like? I know all the details aren't necessarily worked out. It warrants a second look. Uh, but I think if we subsidize that and we ask some of our seniors and some of our folks to go in and pay a membership, we ask them to pay twice. And we've got to keep it out in front. Okay. We've got just a few minutes left, uh, Mr. Montgomery. Yeah, I think in just terms of the information that we, we bring back in, in terms of those details, I think a lot of the, the comments and questions out here, there are answers to those pieces and, and they can be flushed out um, a lot more. Um, and so I think those, that, that information will be helpful just to make sure we have a, a big picture of it in terms of what that subsidizing actually is, what yeah. those real costs are, and as compared to if we were landlords, what that, what that would look like in terms of from a landlord standpoint compared to an operations standpoint and people and what that looks like um, to make sure that we're comparing the same thing and we'll get that information back as well. Um, and um, when it comes to the, the actual membership and, and individuals there, I, I promise you uh, that I could fill the chambers twice with, with community members who would advocate for it that lives in everyone's ward um, within the city that goes to this Y from the West Ward to the Southeast Ward to the Northwest Ward to the Northeast Ward that people choose to come mm -hmm. to the Winston Lake Y for that community, for that um, experience that, that exists there. And so I, I think it, it is, is one, as we look at it, that there are stakeholders from an, the entire community that have a vested interest in this. It's, it is located in the East Ward, but there are people from the entire city uh, that utilize this facility for the purpose because they enjoy the community that exists there and how we continue <coughs> to move that forward. I think we keep that big picture in mind that it's, it's not just one, one community yeah. that, that use it, although it's located there. And it, may have a larger benefit for the neighborhoods directly around that that membership comes from a variety of areas and I don't know if, if it's if you all allow for that data be published but if, if there's a way to, to to wash through your data of membership there in terms of maybe seeing 
the yeah. type of terms of where yeah. they live. We've got all that by zip down, zip code breakdown, where do they live? I think that'd be helpful. Good to have to, to see okay. that. 30 seconds for Ms. Adams. Yeah. We going um, I had a community meeting Thursday night at Bethania, Old Town 102 outside of staff was there. Their concern is the Bethania Long, Leaf, Long Creek Golf Course closed last week. Uh, and the people that live there in that community, they view that golf course and the pool and all of that around it just like we view what we have in our neighborhoods. There are no parks on the north end. We're about to build one, but that may be next year or whatever. There are no parks. So that, their concern was just like what we're saying now. They pay taxes. They were annexed in 2006. They don't see the benefit outside of trash and some streets outside the private ones. They want us to look at how can we help them retain that as it is to some degree and what the city can come up with. So, you know, my, my peers, I'll be, I or the staff will be bringing something to you as to whether we take that and turn it into a park, whether we get some funding from the feds, the state, and wherever, the land, urban institute, whatever, somebody. Uh, how many acres is it? 100 and, see, they know, 164 acres. Whether we keep a three, a nine hole golf course and let the other nine go, create a walk trail. They don't have any of this now. We don't have walking paths and bike paths. We don't have none of that. Not that far north. And we annex those people. And right now it's 2016. We're talking 10 years. They want to collect on their tax money. So just okay. think about that. Let, let, let me summarize to the staff. I think there is an interest in getting more information here. I think bottom line is what we're really talking about is another, I don't you want to call it a community center or, or a rec center, whatever you want to call it. But why is it only going to use 15% of the square footage? So where I hear a lot of questions on what is the city going to do with the 85% we're going to have more detail there. I'd like mm -hmm. to see a floor plan. I'd also like information on where the other regional rec centers are to see how close they are. Also some information on maybe coordinating this with the new aquatic center. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, okay. If my memory is correct there, the city does not own any indoor pools. That's right. So, but we are going to have a new outdoor pool near here. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Great. So if y'all could continue to pull some verification together, we'd appreciate it. I do want to make one correction. Uh, Ms. McCullough, if you'll note this, item G5, which was the uh, historic house, goes to the council November the 7th because we have to run an ad advertising the public hearing. So if you'll let the owner know that I told him it was Monday night. Yeah, it's in the last day, I mean, not yeah. So it'll be uh, November the 7th, if you'll let him know. But tell him he's certainly welcome to come <laughs> Monday night. <laughs> With that, we will stand adjourned and the public safety will start at 610. Uh, 610. Thank you.